Good evening. I'm speaking now to you in Tangier, and I'm speaking to a global audience. People are watching us, I know, from the United States, from France, bonsoir, and maybe even from Saudi Arabia. We have a very good colleague. Everybody knows Murad Ben Kiran. He is performing his Hajj uh, requirements, and he may be watching us from Mecca or the Medina. I'm not sure where he is. So if he's watching us, uh, <laughs> he is in Mecca. Um, we, I just want to give you a very brief history about why we're doing this. The media has some questions, uh, and I will then uh, introduce to you the, the great speaker we have tonight. Uh, in 2009, I established a Center for Global Humanities at the University of New England in Maine. <clears throat> it was somewhat of a bold move. There had not been a center like that in the state, uh, and uh, it was designed to be open to the public, and the goal is to invite prominent speakers and thinkers to enlighten us about the condition of the world today. Very often, uh, people try to understand uh, the world through um, news bites or sound bites uh, by surfing the web or watching television or and even those who are more ambitious by watching a 15-minute TED talk. Uh, I think what we are lacking in our civilization today is the ability to read books, real books, and to think profoundly and uh, with the help of scholars like Anthony Pagden about the condition of the world today. So 2009, our Center for Global Humanities is up and functioning. We have a great list of speakers coming this year. Uh, we, our first speaker is actually speaking on September 23rd. He's a neurobiologist who's going to talk about the relationship between the brain and compassion. Uh, and I will be there for that. You please watch us online. We also have those events broadcast online. And I, since we built this campus in Tangier, we had some very prominent speakers uh, give lectures here. One of them is Tony David, who is a great friend now and colleague, and he's teaching our students. He's sitting there with his fiance, Rebecca. But it has been a place that has attracted increasingly very good speakers uh, to the city. I think the city of Tangier needs a forum like this, a place where people could go, uh, people would go to to listen to great ideas, discuss them without without a tremendous amount of uh, passion, but to and and so that we can all be enlightened and think better about the condition of the world today. And I personally, I don't think there's a better place in Morocco than Tangier to do so. And I don't think there's one, it's, Tangier must be one of the few places on earth, not just the Mediterranean, but uh, around the globe, to bring east and west, north and south uh, to this very place to talk about the issues that are dividing us and they're also uniting us. And um, so with that in mind, uh, we decided uh, well, I decided to, to do the same thing in Tangier by launching the Tangier Global Forum. And you could see we have now, it's written in two languages, it's in Arabic and French, and so to remind audiences that we live in an Arabic-speaking country. And um, we have a great list of speakers coming up this year. Uh, when, by the time you'd be leaving, somebody will give you brochures of the calendar for the rest of the year, so please take it and make sure you mark your calendars to come and attend. Well, I, I'm very delighted uh, to, uh, I mean, I, when I was thinking about who will be the inaugural speaker for this event, or for this series, or for this forum, I couldn't think of a better person than Anthony Pagden. I, uh, he has many, many books. He wrote many, all very influential. One of the latest is uh, on the topic of the Enlightenment, which I read and I reviewed in my online magazine. So, a little nervously, I sent him an email inviting him to come, many, almost a year ago, I think, to come give a talk in Tangier. So, uh, he's not easy to find, but I was able to find him, and now he's here with his wife, Julia, who's a classicist, and I think they may be back to Tangier in the near future. Tangier has this effect on people, by the way. If they come to Tangier, they tend to come back. Um, why, the, the, the title of this speech, of, his, of the lecture, is the Enlightenment and why it matters. Now, very few people have a very vague idea about the Enlightenment, but they don't know the details of it, the great ideas that are instrumental in establishing the modern world, 
the kind of world we live in today. And I think I'm sure uh, Anthony will give us a very good idea about that. Anthony is the Distinguished Professor of Political Science and History at the University of California, Los Angeles. Previously, he held positions at the universities of Cambridge and Oxford, the Warburg Institute London, the Johns Hopkins University, and the European University Institute, and has held visiting positions at various other European and American universities. His principal research interests have been the interaction between Europe and non-European worlds. And he really, he has some of his early books do an incredible job in, in trying to highlight those differences or those, those, those clashes, if you will. The political legacy of empire, which is very critical, very, very to our knowledge today, and the history and possible future of cosmopolitanism. He has written numerous books, most recently, Worlds at War, published in 2008, The Enlightenment and Why It Still Matters in 2013, and Burdens of Empire, 2015, which have been translated into several European and Asian languages. He has also written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The New Republic, The National Interest, El Sole 24 in Italy, and El País in Spain. So without further ado, please help me uh, welcoming uh, Professor Anthony Pagden to the podium. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very, very grateful to you for the invitation. Uh, I don't think I was that difficult to find. But, um, <laughs> I may have been taking some time to respond, but I don't think I was that. Um, and um, I'm delighted to be here, and I do indeed hope you will invite us back. And I should say, I'm also greatly, we've only been here for the last uh, 24 hours, but greatly impressed by what the achievement, your achievements and what you're trying to do here. So I'll try, and, I hope, in some sense, to match up that. And what I want to do today is really to set out what, um, first of all, what the Enlightenment, as I understand it, was, because there are a lot of misunderstandings about this term, and how that understanding of what the Enlightenment was can be of some help, perhaps, because all of these conjectures are mere conjectures, in unraveling some of the difficulties that the global community faces today. And that sounds excessively grand, I know, but um, this is... Um, this is where we have to aim for, even if we never get anywhere close to it. And that, that, that has a significance which I hope will become clear later on. Now let me begin. Ever since the 18th century, ever since the period that we think of as the Enlightenment, the world, the world anyway of the West, the world of Europe, and the term the West, incidentally, is a, an Enlightenment invention. The idea that there was this, uh, this place which was not just Europe, but also Europe's overseas settler populations, most notably in North America. The West has been divided intellectually, morally, and often politically into two broad groups who live in perpetual enmity with one another. Their enduring hostility of these two groups derives, although many of them are probably unaware of this, uh, from their acceptance or denial of the arguments made by a small but widely scattered and highly influential group of philosophers, novelists, essayists, poets, playwrights, etc., who made up what they themselves referred to as, in various terms, the Enlightenment. Siècle uh, de Lumière, Siècle de Luces, Auf Klarung, etc. Now, on the one side of this divide, we have those who generally accept, at least in broad outline, the claims and values of the Enlightenment. And to put these very bluntly or very crudely, um, they are uh, that they are prepared to acknowledge human frailty and human capacity for doing harm, but they still have a generally benign view of human rationality and of human benevolence. They believe that it's possible to improve through knowledge, education, and science the human condition. And because they believe this, they also believe that there exists a human nature although few today would use that term, um, which is much the same everywhere. They hold, that is, that although religions and cultures, etc., are important and differences between them must be respected, this can only be so when cultures conform to some minimal standard of behavior towards all their own members 
and to which every rational being of whatever culture can be wrought to understand, even if not to share. Because of this, they also believe that the only possible just society must necessarily be a secular one, that they do not wish to deny anyone the right to believe in gods, but they do not believe that the laws by which human orders their lives can be anything other than human, consensual, intelligible, and changeable. Now, on the other side of the debate, we have those who believe that cultures cannot be questioned or changed by anyone from outside them, and actually not changed much by anyone from in them either. That there exists no such thing as a single rationality, or a single human identity, or even a single rule of justice, but only what the American Michael Walzer has called spheres of justice, overlapping sometimes, but always distinct and always sovereignty. They condemn, therefore, the Enlightenment as seeking under the guise of universality to impose what are, in fact, European norms, European origins on the whole world, and therefore as imperialist, reductive, and ultimately tyrannical. Now, these are the two uh, opposing groups. The first question, however, is what was or is the meaning of this Enlightenment which has created so much sustained acrimony over so long? It is a question, I should say, as old as the Enlightenment, if we take that to be roughly the period with the, what's often referred to as the long 18th century, from around about 1670 through to around about 1815. It's as old as that period itself. Now, on December 1783, the Berliner Monatschrift, a progressive um, Prussian uh, journal, um, published an article on the now somewhat obscure topic of the validity of purely civil marriages by an educational reformer named Johann Friedrich Zöllner. This article contained a footnote um, in which Zöllner asked exactly this question. What is enlightenment? Was ist Aufklärung? This question, he commented dryly, which is almost as important as what is truth, should indeed be answered before one begins enlightening. And I still have never found it answered. By the end of the year, Zöllner had, was inundated by attempts to provide him with an answer, both from those who thought the Enlightenment was the most sublime aspiration of mankind, to those such as the intensely conservative jurist Friedrich Karl von Musa, who denounced it as, I quote, the ruin of all society, which began harmlessly enough with philosophy, but ends with scalping and cannibalism. This, roughly speaking, is the two camps of which I was talking about. So already by the beginning and end of the 18th century, the world is being, European world, intellectual world anyway, is being divided up in this way. Now, the most famous and most influential reply that Zöllner re received came from the greatest, certainly the most lastingly influential of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant. Enlightenment, declared Kant, was simply whatever enabled the individual to exit from what he called his self-incurred minority. By minority, Kant meant, I quote, the inability to make use of one's own understanding without the guidance of another. And he went on to explain that this required the adult individuals to be able I quote, to so step out of the leading reins of the cart to which they are tethered. Now, what he's referring to is an early version of a baby walker in which the child sat in a sort of wooden construction and was pulled along by its parents to teach it how to walk. Now, the baby walker is, of course, intended to teach the infant how to walk. But in Kant's view, the baby walker provided by society, by the church, by convention and prejudice, how, gave only the illusion of learning. In reality, it was meant to keep the child tethered for his entire life. And it was so easy, Kant reflected, so cozy to accept this condition. Most men, he went on, and all the fairer sex, Kant was an outright misogynist, live much as domestic animals do. I quote, if I have a book that has an understanding for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a doctor who judges my diet for me, and so forth, surely I do not need to trouble myself. I do not need to think if I can only pay. Others will take over the tedious business for me. Now, in Kant's uh, view, enlightenment was the process which would allow the individual to walk by himself. But to achieve this end, the individual had first to question what his pastor, his doctor, his books, and so on, and even his ruler had to say. 
He had to cast aside all those what Kant called dogmas and formulas, those mechanical instruments for rational use, or rather misuse, of mankind's natural endowments, which he went on to describe as the ball and chain of his perpetual minority. And he could only do this by standing on his own. The motto of the Enlightenment then was the Roman poet Horace's famous um, phrase, sapere aude, dare to know. True knowledge requires real courage. Now, Kant's essay has often been taken to be, to taking to sum up all that was most important about the Enlightenment, namely, to put it very simply, uh, that is the story of the triumph of unfettered, unconditional reason over the prejudices created by an archaic, repressive, hierarchical society and the religion or religions which helped to provide it with legitimacy. But although reason clearly played a central role in what we think of today as the Enlightenment, there is another very different account of quite what this meant. And it's that story that I want to tell you today. Now, ever since antiquity, ever since human beings began to think critically about the reason for their behavior, the self, the person, has been described as a kind of permanent battleground between two competing forces, reason on the one hand and the passions on the other. It's a commonplace, it's still a commonplace to think in these terms, the heart and the head in constant conflict with each other. Now, one ancient Greek philosophical school the Stoics made much of this. In their view, the Stoic sage lives a gu life guided by reason alone. He avoids all harmful or damaging emotions, and above all, he seeks to see all the evil that might befall him as external to his being, in some way unconnected to himself. Faced with even the most powerful emotions, or the worst of troubles, or the greatest of pleasures, the Stoic wise man remains entirely impassive. This is the doctrine which is called ataraxia, or freedom from anxiety and care. It is also, however, as its critics pointed out, requires an indifference not only to one's own pleasures and sufferings, but inescapably also to those of everyone else. Now, there's another more benign aspect to Stoicism, to which I shall return later. But today, when we speak of someone being stoical, this is roughly what we mean. We also mean much the same thing when we say that someone is being philosophical. I'm being philosophical in front of uh, the, the troubles that I'm facing. It means I'm being indifferent to them. I'm setting them aside. I'm thinking of them as something that doesn't directly affect me, that I can triumph over. And this is an indication, a clear indication, of how central Stoic thinking has become to the entire Western understanding of what philosophy actually is. It is a form of indifference to the outside world, a way of rising above, as it were, uh, the situations, the difficulties, the problems in which you find yourself. Now, the most important of the heirs of the Stoics were the Christians. Most of Christian psychology and Christian ethics relies heavily upon Stoic sources. And in its Christian version, Stoicism dominated most Western thinking about the sources and motives and the necessary moral limitations on, on human behavior. At least, that is, until the 17th century, until the beginning of the period that we think of as, as the sort of initial period of the Enlightenment. Now, at that point, this Manichaean view of the human psyche is divided into these two warring factions, along with other, that other classical distinction between the mind and the body, as a, also as two uh, entities that were in conflict with one another, um, was radically revised. And in this process of radical revision, the passions came to be seen not as forces of disorder to be overcome by reason, but rather as parts of the same cognitive machinery, so to speak, of same, same operation of thinking to which reason itself also belong. This move offered a radically revised account of all what human understanding, human nature was, and on which all of the psychological and anthropological thinking of what we call the Enlightenment was subsequently based. Now, it is best summed up in a celebrated remark by the famous Scottish philosopher David Hume, who must rank along with Kant as among the greatest 18th thinkers of the 18th century. Um, in fact, Kant famously remarked that it was reading David Hume that, uh, I quote, aroused him from his dogmatic slumber. And what Hume said was, I quote, reason is and ought to be a slave of the passions 
and can never pretend to any other office but to serve and obey them. Now, by this, he did not mean that you had to use your reason to, uh, as it were, indulge your passions. You didn't use your reason to find out better ways for enjoying yourself and better ways for avoiding responsibility. What he meant was that without our passions, we would have no reason for reasoning at all, nor for acting. It is our passions which motivate us to think and then activate our will. We all act morally, because, not because we have feel some upswelling of spontaneous sheer goodness within us. We act morally because we, the thought of doing so responds to a passion within us. Often it's, a very, often it's pride, just to say we act morally because we're proud to think that we're moral beings. Now, to put it very simply, and it is very, putting it very simply, um, linked to the passions are what the philosophers of the Enlightenment call sentiments, which are not quite the things that we understand by sentiments. The word sentiment and sentimentality, which was so crucial to 18th century social thinking, has become much debased. What they meant by sentiments were those emotions which arise primarily from the passions of pride, humility, love, and hatred. Now, there are a great many of them, but the most important what I want to say today was what in the 18th century was called sympathy and what we would probably call empathy. Now, one of the most influential proponents of sympathy was another Scot, Adam Smith, a close friend of Hume and the author of The Wealth of Nations, which has earned him the reputation as the father of modern economic science, He's the first great, really great economic thinker. Sympathy, or empathy as we would call it, plays a key role in Smithian economics. But it was in an earlier work, significantly entitled A Theory of Moral Sentiments, that he set out most clearly how, it, how, this, op, how this operated, how sympathy oper or empathy operated. In a key passage, he asked his readers to imagine that they were looking at someone being tortured. So long, he argued, I quote, as we, are, as we ourselves are at our ease, that's to say we're, we're okay, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. That is to say, so long as I'm not being tortured, my senses, my touch, sense, size, and smell, will not inform me, of, tell me anything about what the person is suffering. Modern psychology thinks differently about that, but nevertheless, that, that's the point. We have no direct sensual access to how someone suffers. But... Um, we are connected to other human beings by our imagination. I quote, it is by imagination only that we can form any conception of what are his sensations. Neither can that faculty help us to this in any other way than by representing to us what would be our own if we were in his case. That is to say, by representing to us how we would feel if we were in his place. Not how he, he himself is feeling, but how we would feel if we were in his place. I continue. It is the impressions of our own senses, of our own senses only, not those of his which our imaginations copy. By the imagination we pledge ourselves in his situation, we conceive ourselves enduring all the same torments. We enter, as it were, into his body and become in some measure the same person with him. End of quote. However, this sympathy, this empathy, does not derive from any simple response to the outward display of emotions. I might feel, for instance, some initial fellow feeling with someone I see crying in the street because I know that tears are a sign of suffering. I, when I cry myself, I'm suffering. Or perhaps I might be laughing, but nevertheless, I'm mostly, I'm often usually suffering. But my sympathy for such a person will probably be limited. And most people, when confronted with someone crying in the street, don't like to interfere. They hurry on by and so on. It doesn't affect them. For this reason, Smith believed, the spectator, that is I, the I, will only experience real sympathy for any person once I know why he or she is crying. Only then will I be able to know how I might feel if I were to find myself in the same predicament. In other words, to be at all effective, my initial act of unthinking instinctual empathy has to be activated as to activate my reason. Quote, even our sympathy with the grief or joy of another before we are informed of the cause of either is always extremely imperfect. 
the compassion of the spectator must arise altogether from the consideration of what he himself would feel if he were reduced to the same unhappy situations. It's the same claim as before, and, and this is the crucial phrase, and what as at the same time able to regard it with his present reason and judgment. So I have to feel what you're suffering, and but I have to that has to activate my reason, and I have to reason with my suffering, your suffering, the 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 the, the, the victim's suffering. The compassionate person then is not experience anything as unpleasant as a gut reaction. He is trying to make sense of it. He is reasoning it through. Reason, in Hume's term, has now become a slave to the passions. Now, we have, therefore, a neat formula, quite unlike the traditional view of the, of the um, Enlightenment of being nothing more than the triumph of reason over the passions. Um, passion activates reason, and this, in turn, activates the will. It's the passion that activates my reason for feeling sympathy with that person, empathy, and that then activates my will to do something about it. So if I step in and help, try to help you, I'm doing it because I'm going through this process of passion and reason. So, but, okay, so where does this lead us? It sounds very neat, but where does it get us? Well, in the first place, it is crucial to note that sympathy, in Smith's example, as a sentiment, is not linked to any specific moral or cultural or religious belief. Indeed, it has to operate entirely independent of such limiting conditions. To react as Smith's compassionate spectator does, to emphasize with the sufferer only because he or she is like you, human, you have first, that is, to take the step that Kant's enlightened person had to take. You have to become an adult. This is precisely what Smith's compassionate observer has done. He's looking at this, judging the effect of these sentiments that he's experiencing. He is judging what he would be like independently of any considerations about what his pastor, his ruler, his books, and so on have told him. So it is he who is alone, as it were, in front of uh, the suffering person. He has learnt to live without the comfort of restraining words of kings, judges, pastors, doctors. Or to put it slightly differently, he has learned how to live outside the constraints of the tribe, the nation, or the religion to which he belongs. Before that is, you can, in Smith's words, place yourself in his situation, enter, as it were, into his body and become in some measure the same person with him. You have to first to have learned to know yourself. The unenlightened person, by contrast, will never be able to leave the realm of that ugly term so beloved of Donald Trump, gut feeling, to which his culture has confined him. For him, the other will always appear as simply other, um, with, by almost, with whom, by almost by definition, no empathy is possible. The instinctual response of the unenlightened is to say, I would sympathize with you. I would be able to enter into your suffering. If only you belong to the same sect as I, or part of my group, my tribe, my ethne, my own nation, etc. But as you are, not, I cannot. Now, this concept of rationalized sympathy offered the philosophers of the Enlightenment a simple and highly persuasive psychological principle on which to base a claim to a universal human sociability, which is really the project at hand to create a universal social sociability, both within individual communities and what's much more significant for my purposes, beyond them. No passion, wrote Hume if well understood, i.e. if subjected to reason, no passion, if well understood, can be entirely indifferent to us because there is none of which every man is not within him at least the seeds and first principles. And the evidence for this, he went on, was that, I quote, we seem to have a concern even for those whose lives are remote from ours. Why else, he asked, would we find, as we seem to, I quote, the fate of states, provinces, or many individuals so extremely interesting, even if we have nothing particular in stake at what happens in them? Why otherwise do we read newspapers? 
Why are we moved by reading poetry and by the lives of beings that are entirely imaginary? Hume gives us this example, the sentiments he has when confronted by reading of the cruelty of the Roman emperors Nero and Tiberius, this sense of outrage at what Nero and Tiberius had done, although it's centuries and centuries ago, uh, is evidence of the sympathy and empathy I can engender, even for those who are long dead. No quality of human nature is so remarkable, he went on, but in itself and its consequences than that propensity we have to sympathize with others and to receive by communication their inclinations and sentiments, however different from or even contrary to our own. This is the crucial phrase. From here, it was only a short step to imagining the existence of a world made up of diverse peoples, all united at some level by a common bond of sympathy. Now, this brings me to the other aspect of Stoicism I mentioned earlier. In addition to their reje rejection of what they saw as the damaging effects of the passions, the Stoics also embraced the notion that the natural world was a harmonious whole with a distinct and transcendental purpose. They believed in the existence of what they called common notions, that is a basic collection of ideas that all men may be thought to accept no matter what their creeds or cultural differences. Furthermore, humans were clearly bound by a sentimental attachment to each other. This the Greeks called oikeosis, the natural bond we feel with everything that is akin to ourselves. Thus, my blood relatives, my family, my children are akin in this sense, and because of that, I inevitably love them, however unlovable they may be. Not merely for, their, for my sake, because they're proof of my continuity or they gave me life, but because I um, identify with them. This identification then supposedly reaches out um, to members of the same community or nation and finally to the whole of humanity. And because we all share these common bonds, it followed that the ultimately the whole of humanity should constitute a single body. This, of course, is what today we call cosmopolitanism. And if the Enlightenment had one key philosophical and political position, this was it. Now, nearly all the great philosophers of the Enlightenment declared themselves to be in one way or another cosmopolitans. You belong to all the nations of the earth and never ask a man for his place of birth, the great French uh, philosopher, poet, playwright, etc. Denis Diderot told Hume, I flatter myself that I am like you, a citizen of the great city of the world. And the Baron de Montesquieu, one of the most influential of the French philosophes, confided to that collection of jottings he called his thoughts, his pensées, I quote, if I know of anything advantageous to my family, but not to my country, I should try to forget it. If I know of anything advantageous to my country, but which was prejudicial to Europe or, and to the human race, I should look upon it as a crime, end of quote. Now, Montesquieu's particular way of phrasing this stoic feeling of identity with, that stretches outwards um, raises a question. The enemies of cosmopolitanism from the ancient world to today have all complained that humanity was a mere abstraction, that in harsh reality it was far easier to care, to claim at least, that you were caring for the species as a whole, that you loved the whole of humanity, than it was to love one's immediate, demanding, and often far from lovable family or community, one's country or one's patria. Much easier to claim that you love humanity than any of those things because ultimately humanity is too far away to make any demands on you or any direct demands on you at least. Love of humanity was in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's harsh denunciation of it the brainchild, I quote, of those pretended cosmopolites who boast of loving all the world in order to enjoy the privilege of loving no one, end of quote. Theirs, he went on, was merely a world of the mind, have nothing to do with those cosmopolitans who wish to find at a distance in their books, he wrote, the duties they do not deign to fulfill among themselves, and he advised the future architects of his ideal state, such philosophers love the Tatars, so as not to have to love his neighbor. Now, it's telling criticism, um, and it's not one that's hasn't got. It's not. It's not one that's not repeated today. Um, Montesquieu's pensée, however, is quite explicit about the care note 
and this is also true of most of, of the uh, stoic ways of viewing um, the oikiosis, is but um, not to care not only for humanity, but also for one's friends, one's family, uh, one's community, and one's patria, and so on. In Montesquieu's case, of course, also for Europe as a whole. And Adam Smith arrived at the same conclusion by a somewhat different route. If he said, I quote, the wise and virtuous man was always willing, as Smith assumed he must be, to sacrifice his own private interests to those of, I quote, the public interests of his own particular order and society, and if that same man recognized that this should in turn be, I quote, sacrificed to the greater interest of the state or sovereignty of which he is only a subordinate part, then it followed, that I quote, he should be equally willing that all those inferior interests should be sacrificed to the greater interest of the universe. In all cases, what you're talking about then is a series of, un of, of circles which move outwards for the love that you feel for yourself, which is necessary for survival if I don't love myself. Uh, in some sense, I am... I am likely not to survive for very long, and move outwards through those of my immediate family uh, to the larger community and so on and so on and so forth. So without those aspects, without, as it were, loving those aspects or having care for those aspects, you're not going to be much use of caring for society. But furthermore, and this is crucial, neither Montesquieu nor Smith nor any of the other, I should say, nor Hume, nor Didot, nor Voltaire, nor any of the other great cosmopolitan thinkers who phrase much the same kind of... Uh, notion of the relationship between these various stoic circles, as they're sometimes called, uh, were speak, as does Rousseau, uh, as indeed does do all patriots and nationalists, in terms of love. And this is, seems to me a crucial part of the story. They do not speak in love. They speak in terms of interests and obligations. They also, and this is something to which I return, thought in terms of a wider community based not merely upon uh, common identities and certainly not on a common political structure, but upon a common set of laws as an expression of those interests and obligations. And although one might be called upon to respect and even honor the laws, no one can plausibly be asked to love them. Love, of course, requires an object, and an object is always a person or an animal or a god imagined as a person or a group of persons imagined as a person. So you only love persons. You may think you love dogs, but actually you love what, you, what you're identifying in the dog as a person, and so on. And we can only ever love what we know. Loving things in the abstract is, a, is an impossibility. The implication latent in the phrase love of country is that it might be possible to experience deep emotional attachment to persons as members of a group who one does not actually know and whom as individuals one might even actively dislike only because they are members of a group. Now the larger or more alien or more abstract the thing one is supposed to love becomes, the more impossible it becomes to imagine what that love might actually entail. What does it mean to say I love my country? What does it mean to say I love my community? What does it mean to say I love my humanity? I can see what it means to say I have obligations and duties towards them, but to love them, what does that, what can that possibly mean? Now, the relationship of the cosmopolitan to the cosmos, seems to me, is far more realistic and far more honest than this supposed love for the community. To go back again to Smith's image of the person being tortured, what this spectacle arouses in me by this process of transition from um, um, passion to reason, what this empathy does is create not love precisely, but empathy. I can or should be able to feel empathy for any person. He or she is a person because she or she is a person, even if that person happens to be repellent to me. And I can act to relieve him, but I can never be called upon to love him. Now, what all the cosmopolitans of life me were asking for, therefore, was in effect a vision of the human which demanded a degree of attachment, which, although it began at home, did not because of that simply stop at the nearest frontier, cultural, religious, or natural. 
Of course I care more for myself and my family than I do, for instance, for the displaced masses in Syria or Iraq. If I did not, I would be truly guilty, as Rousseau put it, of loving the entire world in order to enjoy the privilege of loving no one. But what Kant called the true cosmopolites, or the uh, cosmothoroi, students of the world, were not being asked to sacrifice their love of family or of patria, or of, or of themselves even, much less they were being asked to subsume their identity, identity into anything quite so amorphous as the cosmos. Indeed, these true cosmopolites were moved by what Kant called, I quote, their inclination to promote the well-being of the entire world. By promoting well-being, neither acquires loving the entire world nor sacrificing the love one feels for one's own kin. All that the cosmopolitans are being asked to do is to keep their eyes fixed upon a wider horizon of humankind itself, what Kant significantly called global patriotism. Now, again, all well and good. However, if all of this is to be more than wishful thinking, it would seem to require some kind of social and political expression. None of the early writers of the Enlightenment gave much thought to what this might be, but Kant did. One day he believed this global patriotism, coupled with a purely calculating and self-interested desire to put an end to warfare, would lead all the nations of the world to form what he called at different times a federation, a confederation, a partnership, a league of peoples, an international state, and a universal union of states. His views varied very considerably as to what these would be um, over a relatively short period of time, which tends to coincide with the French Revolution, which may have influences changing views on the matter. Now, Kant's famous vision of, u of universal society of the Enlightenment, based upon what he called cosmopolitan right, the jus cosmopoliticum, which greatly inspired, it should be said, the founders of both the League of Nations and the United Nations, was, as he fully understood it, an idea, or what he called a dream of perfection. And as such, it could only ever be a condition of future time. Like all such ideas, however, he insists that it should never be abandoned, I quote, under the very wretched and harmful pretext of its impracticability. We might never get there, in Kant's view, we almost certainly would not, but we should always keep it before us as an objective, since for Kant, the very fact that we're able to imagine such a state, it is our duty, I quote, to work towards this, not, not merely chimerical end. Now, Kant was writing in 1795, and it is this idea of his still very much a condition of future time. But in the years since the end of the Second World War, it has provided the theoretical foundations for modern conceptions of international justice, geo-governance, global civil society, and their like. And it's been the inspiration behind the creation of a number of admittedly highly imperfect institutions, not utterly unlike the kind that Kant had hoped for. Above all, the United Nations itself, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the International Labour Organization, and so on. And of course, we have had, since 1948, a universal declaration of human rights. Now, it's true, its demands are vague, and there are many of these rights, including the right to free health care and education, for instance, to which even the most conscientious and wealthy countries do not subscribe. But it has been perhaps the single most, that's to say the notion of human rights, the single most influential concept in shaping uh, foreign policy in the West since at least the late 1970s. And the very idea of a human right would have been unimaginable without some idea of a global community bound together by a common sense of what it is to be human, bound together precisely by this notion of what we can feel for others, this empathy we feel for others. All very well, you might say. Right, fine sentiments, especially for those well-educated and prosperous enough um, to reap real benefits from it, those members of the globalized elites of which we have heard so much recently. All right for those who actually are able, in Kant's metaphor, to step out of their leading reins and walk for themselves. And, of course, Kant never explains what the first, how you go about doing that Today, however, our troubled world would seem to be moving in the very opposite direction. The influence of the religious, 
never once be very keen on daring to know, the xenophobes, the racists, would appear to be on the increase from Turkey to Russia to Europe to the USA. Witness the astonishing ride of Donald Trump, a man without policies who trades on lies, half-truths and defamations, and declares that he makes decision with, in again that disgusting metaphor, his gut. Look at what happened recently uh, in what I would have, without embarrassment, have called my country. A large number of people, uh, the majority of those who voted, not the majority of the population, voted to overturn 33 years of prosperous, if also bumpy, membership of the European Union. What is, for all its undeniable faults, a larger frontierless world. Now, they did not do so because they opposed the economic policies of the EU, which might have been a reasonable position to take, about which very few of them seemed to know anything at all. They did so because, the like the majority of the supporters of Trump, they believed that their problems could be resolved by building walls, either physical, in Trump's case, or legal and economical in theirs. They had been persuaded that the fellow feeling, empathy in the language of the Enlightenment, is due only to those who belong to the same community, be it religious, racial, ethnic, or cultural, or national, to which they themselves belong. And they, this does not mean simply abiding by the laws of the places to which they have come. I mean, that's to say, it doesn't, that would seem to be incontestable. It means following their customs, wearing their clothes, speaking their languages, and so on. Little wonder, perhaps, that in Britain, in the British case, this, demonst this demonstration of the appeal of xenophobia at the ballot box resulted barely a month after the referendum in a 20% rise in recorded hate crimes against predominantly Muslims because of the refugee crisis, but also Jews and anyone else, including, of course, other Europeans who appeared to be foreign. Now, for all of that, uh, the rise of the new xenophobia may not be quite as all-embracing as it now seems. Erdogan and Putin seem to be here to stay for a while longer, but Trump will probably not be elected, and the Trump phenomenon, which dominates the US media on both the left and the right, may well, if Trump fails, lead to a revised appreciation of some of those core values so often trumpeted, no pun intended, but so rarely either embraced or understood enshrined in that singular enlightenment document, the US Constitution. Among them, that the government and law must be free of any religious interference, and that democracy should not mean mob rule and the tyranny of the minority by the majority. Now, in the case of the EU, the initial response to Brexit, the breaking away uh, of the vote to break from the Union, has not, as its champions had assumed and hoped, Lead, led to an escalation of demands for similar referenda in other European states. Indeed, it seems at least initially to have led to a marked increase in pro-European sentiment, particularly among the young, who of course in Britain voted overwhelmingly against leaving the Union. Up, according to a recent poll, 81% in Germany and there across the Straits in Spain. The fear that right-wing parties in France, Greece, Austria, Germany and Denmark would profit uh, in, and in other ways by the British example does not seem to have borne out, not of course that they haven't tried. And it's interesting that when Marine Le Pen launched her bid for the French presidency two weeks ago, she did so simply as Marine. No mention of either her surname, uh, too closely associated with her father, or nor even the party, the national front he had created and which she now leads. She was just Marine. The future it seems to be distancing herself very considerably from the kind of xenophobic rhetoric of the past. The future, of course, is still uncertain. But it's worth stressing that the EU is not by any means the only expression of enlightened cosmopolitanism. In global terms, the older structures of nation states locked into either uneasy compromise or incessant conflict with one another is beginning to unravel. The older European order, as it's been called, which emerged out of the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, which is, in a sense, the founding moment of what's called the European state system, and therefore spread to the rest of the world, was based upon the political, cultural, and religious integrity of what we now call the nation state. And that, in turn, 
was based upon a notion which has since become a creed of the indivisibility of sovereignty, that every nation's sovereignty is sacrosanct, that it cannot be invaded by any others, and crucially, that its sovereignty remains uh, within its own boundaries. It cannot be shared uh, with any other state. Indivisible sovereignty has become, of course, and has been since the early 19th century, the core doctrine of modern national nationalism. And inevitably, it became the political expression of much that xenophobia stands for and cosmopolitanism obviously stands against. During the run-up to the Brexit debate, we heard a lot of wildly inaccurate nonsense about how Brussels, which sort of stands as a metonym for the EU, was taking sovereignty away from the British national parliaments. Nothing could be further from the truth. But the claim was couched in those terms. What mattered was we were being, quote as one person, but robbed of our country because our sovereignty was being taken from it. Um, but the modern state system in practice is inescapably based upon shared or divided sovereignty. You only have to think of the range of economic interests that spread across national boundaries to see that. Um, things like the internet and so on are not great respecters of sovereign territories. Um, it's based upon divided sovereignty, overlapping authorities, sustained by international rules of law, and upon shared and multiple identities. While the real power of all functional modern states across the globe, even the United States, is inextricably and increasingly dependent upon their membership of larger communities of states, something that Donald Trump does not understand. Indeed, the only modern state which enjoys the kind of undivided sovereignty which Trump and the Brexiters pine for would seem to be North Korea. Now, such an emerging post-national order comes far closer to anything which has preceded it to the Kantian notion of global patriotism. Although still very much in embryo, it has the making of not so much a political system as which Kant, of course, in fact, did think it needed, as of a new legal community. And it may well be the law, I'm talking about the future here, may well be the law, more precisely what the Romans called the law of nations, and we today call international law, to which we must look for the possibility of an enlightened view, a panacea for our troubled world. For modern international law was itself the creation, and one of the great creations of the Enlightenment. And it was grounded, originally at least, on precisely those principles of empathy I have tried to describe. If the argument went, I can empathize with my fellows, no matter what their cultures, religious beliefs, languages, etc., then surely I can sit down with them and thrash out a common code of laws to which we can all agree to be bound. This was a geo-legal expression was the geolegal expression of those overlapping sets of obligations and interests which both Smith and Montesquieu saw as the core of any kind of enlightened cosmopolitanism. Now, I'm not unaware, I hasten to add, of the troubled history of international law, its close association in its heyday in the 19th century with the so-called civilizing mission of the European colonial powers, its defeat, almost the point of extinction in the 1960s, at the, in, within the academy anyway, at the hands of realists, realist international relations theory. But since its re-emergence, somewhat triumphant re-emergence, I should say, at the beginning of this century, international has become, despite its inescapable European origins, increasingly intranational, embracing not just European, but also non-European international interpersonal legal thinking. A globalized world then, diverse and multicultural, but under the broad tutelage of an international consensus of the rule of law, offers the most hopeful future, I su suggest, for our troubled world. And if we do achieve anything like that, and of course it's still, as Kant would say, a condition of future time, although it may not be the fulfillment of the world of emphatic, emphasizing, sentimental, in the 18th century sense of the term, human beings communicating with each other, as Smith, Hume, and Kant had imagined it might be, it would certainly not be possible without it. Thank you. Thank you.